Lecture 3, Understanding the Old Testament Framework. So in our last lecture, we talked about the overall framework for all of Scripture. We talked about that in four categories or four scenes, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. We recognized that each one of these scenes functions as a kind of lens that you can take the topic that you want to study and run it through all of these categories. And in the process, you can see the development of a topic or the development of an idea across all of Scripture. These categories, however, are really more, more like theological categories. In other words, what we're watching here is a, a, a grid that we're placing over Scripture, but it's not exactly chronological. And to talk about something more chronological, we have to move into the next discussion, which is to actually understand the framework by time period. The most basic framework for Scripture is the Old and New Testaments. We will talk about that in a future lecture when we transition between the Testaments. For now, our focus will just be getting a, a broad view perspective of the entire Old Testament. How do we understand the flow of thought, the development of ideas, and doing this chronologically within the Old Testament now? And we're zooming in on that particular portion of Scripture. On our way there, I'd like to look at a passage actually drawn from the New Testament and a bit of a question it raises, a bit of a confusion we might have, trying to understand something that's going on. This is the very beginning of the New Testament. It's Matthew chapter 1. It's the introduction to Jesus the Messiah. And therefore, we should expect this to be very critical for our understanding of the entire Bible, and even as an interpretation looking backwards towards the Old Testament. Let me show you what I mean. The chapter starts out with a very strong connection to Old Testament statements. This is linking Matthew and the rest of the New Testament to everything that came before for several reasons. This is the book of the generation of Jesus the Messiah. When we read the word Christ, critical to know, you're looking at the word Messiah. He's the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament looked forward to. Even this book of the generations of is drawn, really lifted, right out of the book of Genesis. That was the structuring phrase that drove the book of Genesis, and from which we derive our primary outline or understanding of the book of Genesis. In fact, the word Genesis is really derived from this, the word generation. So Matthew 1 has started off by calling all of that information into mind as a strong echo of the book of Genesis and a strong echo, therefore, of the entire Old Testament. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus, the Messiah, is the son of David and the son of Abraham. And now that's entirely unsurprising because all across the Old Testament, we've seen a strong pattern with Abraham promises, promises to him about his seed, and Davidic promises, promises to him about his seed. So, okay, we could expect some of this. And as we proceed through the genealogy, we see this. Abraham is mentioned, David the king is mentioned, and it's not just David, but that phrase is added in there, David the king, and David the king begat Solomon, and so forth. There's another pattern a bit later, and it's this pattern when they were carried, or the time when they were carried away to Babylon, which leads us to the summary of the entire section. Matthew 1.17, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. From the carrying away into Babylon unto the Messiah are 14 generations. Now here's where this gets interesting. In Matthew's pattern, in the genealogy he's recorded, in fact, yes, depending on how, some, some details that are there, but yes, these are divided out into 14, 14, 14. So, okay, that's what he's summarizing. The thing that's really interesting is once you compare this genealogy to the Chronicles, to Genesis, to Ruth, you discover that there are some generations left out. And that's not a mistake on Matthew's part. It's intentional. This was very common in how people did genealogies. So you're not going to list every single person. You're a bit selective. And you're kind of summarizing the big picture, tracing the story. Still, it's just really interesting, maybe a little borderline odd, that there would be this language or this emphasis on 14 when, in fact, there were other generations in there. So what's he doing? Why highlight that? And besides that, just while we're here, why start off the New Testament with a genealogy anyway? 
I, I, every Bible reader who starts out in Genesis and they proceed through comes to a genealogy and most of the time people groan when they reach a genealogy. And to reach the New Testament and right at the beginning to encounter another genealogy. Why? Is there a reason for this? What's the point? And I'm going to just leave that question for a little while. I'm going to leave that hanging so that we can return back to that question at the end, because there is an answer. It's an important answer, and it's one that we will talk about, but we have to understand some other things first. Specifically, I want to lay the foundation by giving you a summary or a survey of the Old Testament eras. Now, what I'm going to do here is take the entire Old Testament chronologically, and we're just going to look for the big picture view of the major time periods across the Old Testament. I'm going to give you this to you in a very simple, simple, oversimplified Bible timeline. And here you're looking at, of course, you see the whole picture, but we're going to focus for now on the Old Testament side of things. So here on the Old Testament side of things, we recognize this framework from creation to Abraham and the patriarchs, and roughly 6,000 to 1850 using the chronology we'll use. Exodus to Joshua, Judges and the Kings, the Exile, and the Return. I've also included in here not only the dates, but the, a bit of a simplification summary, but the general section of scripture that is in each one of these categories. So Genesis really covers the patriarchs. Exodus through Joshua really are talking about those books, Exodus through Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, covering that period. Judges and the Kings, the historical books, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and really the Chronicles as well, covering a slightly different angle. The period of the exile, the prophets, and finally the return, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. I've not included everything in here. We recognize that we have the poetic books and the wisdom books, which are chronologically basically going to fall within this range. But yes, this as kind of a general summary of the five eras of the Old Testament. We need to talk, however, about each one of these in a bit more detail and to appreciate what's happening with them. So I'm going to give you the summary of all of the eras. And then I want to look at passages of scripture with each that capture the heart or capture the emphasis of each one of those sections. The first era of creation through Abraham and the patriarchs, I'm going to refer to as a dawning hope. The glimmers of light begin to come and we start to see that hope remains, that God will send a solution to the problem of sin. The Exodus until Joshua, I will summarize that the promises begin to be fulfilled with the birth of the nation. You see the nation growing and you see hope in that nation fulfilling the promises made to Abraham. Judges and the kings, however, it turns in another direction. The nation's long decline because of sin and rebellion. The exile, Israel comes under judgment together with the nations. Just as the nations were judged and destroyed, now Israel also will be destroyed. And the final movement, returning to the land, the promise and hope remains. Now, let me do each one of these or explain each one of these looking at specific passages of Scripture, and let's just understand what's happening in each case. Starting with the promises made to Abraham, if you're thinking of Genesis through Abraham, you see, of course, the results of sin, the curse, and, and just the despair. Is there any hope now for mankind? How will we see the problem of sin resolved? You remember Genesis 3.15, the promise of the seed the one that will be born to the woman. And then kind of that hope tossed about a little bit. The hope that is maybe Noah, the fulfillment of that. Will Noah be the offspring that will deliver us from the curse? And the answer is, well, as a matter of fact, no. And looking ahead then, one just kind of wonders, where will this hope come from? Until you come to Abraham. And God calls Abraham out and in a series of multiple interactions with Abraham, starting in Genesis 12, but especially 15, 17, and where we're going to look right now, Genesis 22. This promise expands and grows. And now there's hope. Hope not just for Abraham, but for the world. Genesis 22:17. The curse has turned to blessing. 
In blessing, I will bless thee. In multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens. Do you remember the promise or the, the blessing that was given to Adam and Eve? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Well, that is all gone off the tracks. It's all a mess now. But Abraham and through Abraham, there will be multiply, multiplication again as the sand which is upon the seashore and your seed, your descendants will possess the gate of his enemies. It's victory over the enemy, the one that threatens, which kind of recalls the struggle, the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. And finally, verse 18, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And notice three different times we've had the word blessing or bless or blessed. The curse has turned to a blessing. And multiple times throughout then we've also seen the word seed or offspring. The key to that blessing is the descendant of Abraham. Now, pause for a second there because I said descendant. And you may have noticed that there are enough references within those verses that you would kind of expect descendants. Hebrew works just like English when you say seed. It's not immediately obvious whether we're talking about one or many. The word is the same either way. And so there could be some ambiguity. Could this refer to all of Abraham's offspring in the nation or in all of the Jewish people? The world would be blessed. Why would it refer to a single individual? Paul much later in Galatians 3 will argue that Abraham or that Genesis speaks not to seeds as of many, but to one seed as of Christ. And Paul argues then that the seed is singular, not plural. It refers to a single individual. Grammatically, you can't really support that because the word would be the same either way. So what is Paul thinking to argue that the seed is one? And the answer is you have to watch the pattern starting back in Genesis 3.15 and moving forward. That the pattern goes, yes, there will be offspring, many of them. But the ultimate hope of the world is an individual, the seed, the offspring of the woman. And it's the pattern of the entire Old Testament taken together that helps us to realize that there's only one way to understand offspring in Genesis. It's the singular, the singular seed that will bring hope. This is why I say Genesis, the creation account all the way through Abraham and the patriarchs, is a dawning hope. We're looking at the details and you can't always put everything together. You're not even sure what it always means and, and you're trying to hold the pieces together. But there's enough hope there and enough information to know that mankind does have a future, a future of victory over sin. There is a deliverer coming who will set mankind free from all the horrors of sin and the curse. And in that, we find hope. The second section is the Exodus through Joshua. And here, what we're watching is God delivering the nation from Egypt, the bondage and absolute slavery that Israel was under. There's a very interesting comment at the beginning of Exodus that God remembers his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And on that basis, God sees their sorrow and he delivers because he remembers the promises he made. And what that's doing is just linking the Exodus event to everything that came before so that we discover the Exodus event is absolutely resting on the foundation of the promises that God made to the forefathers. As you know, in the Exodus account, God works with Israel and works with Egypt. Ultimately, Israel goes out in a triumphant victory, and all the nations of the earth hear about this, even the nations all the way out into Palestine where Israel is going, hear the story of how God delivered them from the Egyptians, and they fear. And that also is part of God's plan. God is paving the way. So Israel enters in on their great triumphant journey to go up to the promised land. Everything will be just easy now to enter in and take the promised land, the victory that is coming. Well, we discover quickly in Exodus that Israel has a problem. They sin. And that problem then means that judgment comes. In fact, an entire generation falls in the wilderness because they refuse to enter into the promised land that God gave them. 
And the hope then, as we press forward to the end of the wilderness wanderings in Deuteronomy, is that if Israel will only obey God's law and hear his words, if only they would do what he gave them to do, then there would be hope for the nation. We read about this this way in Deuteronomy 4. I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me. This is the Ten Commandments. This is the entire Old Testament law. If you would only do them, if you would do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of, then you could be blessed. Keep them and do them. That will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, the nations, who, when they hear all these statutes, these laws, they will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? What great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? The implication, of course, being that Israel has received special blessing from the hand of God. The law, the revelation that he's given them, the guidance and the blessing, even the deliverance from Egypt. If they would only hear and do what he gave them to do, they could be blessed. As we're going to see moving into Joshua, there is an initial surging of hope. I mean, the beginning of the book of Joshua, be strong, courageous, go up, do what God has given you to do. Do not fear, just do it. Just do what he said. If only you'll do it, he will bless. And initially the nation does. The book of Joshua ends on a very optimistic and exciting note. Here there is hope. Israel seems to have taken the land. Already there are slight hints of some failures. But in any case, for the bulk of it, yes, Israel has obeyed. And God is absolutely fulfilling his word until we come to the next section. And the third section we discuss here is judges and the kings, the nation's long decline because of sin and rebellion. Here, the story turns honestly rather depressing. It turns depressing because we discover that Israel has not obeyed. And now we enter into what seems like a perpetual cycle of the people rebelling, turning away, getting distracted, paying attention to idols, and after a period of time, then falling into great chaos and persecution and suffering under oppression. They cry out to God. God delivers them. And there's a kind of a half-hearted revival until they sin again, and they fall, and everything crashes back again. And this cycle just keeps on going. The end of the book of Judges ends on a, a, a bitterly pessimistic note. Just saying, and actually multiple times across the book, that in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And this comes at the end of the book when you have just watched some of the most horrifying accounts. Israel has become like Sodom. Sin has infected these people until it's actually hard to even tell who are the faithful ones and who are not. You can't even tell if Israel is different from the nations. They seem just the same. Now, you notice in that statement that part of the problem is linked to the lack of a king. There was no king in Israel. So maybe the solution is that if Israel could get a righteous king, maybe things would be better. And in fact, as you move into the subsequent books, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, later 1 and 2 Chronicles, then you see the pattern that God does provide a king. Initially, Saul is the first king. Saul does not turn out to be a righteous king, but the second king, David, is a very righteous king. His son, Solomon, is at least a wise king. And the result of this is a flourishing time of great wealth, great liberty, great victory. Israel truly flourishes among the nations in a way that sounds like it's fulfilling all of the hopes that we saw back in Deuteronomy. It's a rich and beautiful time. The problem, of course, is that these righteous kings are not perfect. David sins conspicuously. Solomon sins even more conspicuously. 
And following them, things only get worse. The kingdom splits into two. One half of the entire nation is so sodden with idolatry and wickedness that they're going to be judged very soon, very shortly after. The nation or this other side of the kingdom, the southern kingdom, Judah, continues with a, a kind of a quasi-righteousness, but falling back into sin and falling into righteousness, back into sin. And this cycle continues on all the way through until eventually they also are so wicked they're going to be judged. And the warning throughout this period that God continually gives them, if they do not repent, then he will return them back to bondage. And the way to think of this is that Israel is going to kind of return to a kind of Egypt again. This time it'll be Babylon. But as they were delivered from Egypt and finally set free and given their freedom, they'll go back. In fact, there's more. Even some of the descriptions are to say that Israel will be dealt with the same way that God dealt with the pagan nations that Israel pushed out of the land. Part of the vision of the conquest in Joshua was that these were wicked nations and it was the time God was ready to judge them for their great wickedness. And so he used Israel to punish them. Now everything has turned around to the point that Israel is as wicked as they were. And now he will use Babylon to punish Israel. And a very good passage for summarizing this period is the prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel is in Babylon. He's reading Jeremiah and he's reading some of the promise that God gave that after 70 years, God would return his people back. Daniel places his hope in this and joyfully, but also repentantly in a, a kind of lament, Daniel prays and confesses the sin of his people. Daniel chapter 9, 13 as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. I mean, none of this was a surprise. You told us back in Deuteronomy that you would judge us if we sinned. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God. We have not turned from our iniquities. We have not gained insight by your truth. And therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. Why? Because the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done and we have not obeyed his voice. Daniel's strong confession in this chapter is to say that the exile, with all of its horror, its pain, and its sorrow, is not God's fault. It is absolutely and entirely the nation's fault. We have sinned. We have turned away. And you have dealt with us only righteously. The final period I'd like to highlight is returning to the land. Now, historically here, we're looking at Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. We're looking at the books that record Israel going back up. But I'm going to show you a passage that points ahead to this. And this is from one of the prophets, Jeremiah. He's looking ahead to a day when God will deliver like this. And he says, thus declares the Lord, after 70 years are accomplished in Babylon, after you have suffered in exile for that time, I will visit you. I will perform my good word toward you, and I will cause you to return to this place, Jerusalem. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I, I would translate this to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me. You will go and pray unto me. That's what we saw in Daniel 9. I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations, from all the places where I have driven you, saith the Lord. I will bring you back again to the place from where I caused you to be carried away captive. I will return you back to your homeland again, and there will be hope. Now, this verse appears in all kinds of greeting cards and Instagram memes and all kinds of materials that people use because we like this kind of concept. I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of hope. And so we view this as very positive and encouraging and we apply it directly to ourselves. In context, really what's going on here is God's commitment that he's not done with a nation. He will return Israel back to the land according to his good word. And just to summarize all of that again and make sure that we've understood these five eras of the Old Testament, you can notice a kind of shape or a kind of progression to each one of these eras. 
we can recognize that as the Old Testament proceeds, we start out with, at the beginning, uh, the dawning hope, just a glimmer of light that's growing into fullness of light in Exodus and Joshua. We're very hopeful at this point. The narrative crashing downward in the judges, the kings, and the exile, taking us all the way to the bottom. So that at this point in the story, you really are at a moment of despair. And it's just the end of the Old Testament where we have a bit of a turning upwards just a little turn that gives you some sense of, yes, there's something around the corner. But, but the journey here, that shape, the dawning of the hope, the crashing, and then the final upturn is so perfectly designed to create in us a longing hope. At the very beginning, the rising gives us the sense of something wonderful happening. The crashing really destroys the hopes we have, and the very final turn tells you, but it's not over yet. And that final point, the end, I'd like to just highlight here, is to say, in comparison, let's say, for instance, the rebuilding of the temple, the, the men standing around, some of them are rejoicing because they see that the temple has been rebuilt. Those that remember the old temple are grieving and crying because they remember what the temple used to look like. That's the way the Old Testament ends, a kind of a mix of hope and discouragement. It's pointing you to something more. Something else is coming. Now, I'm going to stop there for now with our discussion of the Old Testament chronology, and I want to give you a different kind of overview. This time, the overview is going to be focused on the covenants or the promises. I've already alluded to some of this, but there are three major covenants you need to know and be familiar with enough that you could talk about them and trace as you go through the Old Testament what's happening with each one of these. In fact, to understand these covenants or these groups of promises is really to, in many ways, to unlock the logic and the beauty of the Old Testament. The covenants are three, the Abrahamic, the Davidic, and the New Covenants. Sometimes we get stuck on the language of covenant. We're not sure what that means. But by covenant, we just mean promise. And by talking about three major covenants, we're recognizing that there are three major groups of promises that kind of orbit together three major categories, each with their own emphasis. So let's understand what these covenants are and the significance of each. I would like to highlight first that the covenants are huge. What I've done here is gather most of the major passages that discuss these covenants. We could include a good bit more, and in some cases maybe even twice as much as what I have represented here. But these are the core passages. I'm not going to go through these passages, nor am I really intending that you read through all of them. As much as I want to emphasize or I want you to see how much information there is for each one of these ideas. What we will do, however, is focus on passages, specific passages, for each one of them to understand well the idea in each. And starting with the covenant with Abraham, we've already just look at, looked at this passage, Genesis 22, 16 to 19. This is the passage we just read talking about the promise that your seed, your offspring, will be a blessing to the nations, that you will inherit all of this land, that your, your nation or your descendants will become great, and they will be many, they will actually fill the earth. So that set of patterns surrounding the Abrahamic covenant are really critical for us understanding the richness of the hope as it's developing in this early part of the Old Testament. I'll move, however, to the second passage because we've already considered Genesis 22. The second passage is 2 Samuel 7, 8 to 16. And here we're talking about the Davidic covenant or promises made to David. There's a very different flavor with these promises and a, a different emphasis that comes. 2 Samuel 7, Therefore you will say unto my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, okay, from following sheep to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. I was with you wherever you went. I cut off all your enemies out of thy sight. I have made thee a great name. We'll notice that pattern. Like unto the name of the great people that are in the earth. I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move about no more. 
Okay, an important pattern we saw with the Abrahamic covenant is also appearing here, the promise of the land. I caused judges to be over my people Israel, and I gave rest over all your enemies. Now I will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, when you're dead, I will set up thy seed after thee. Do you remember the pattern with the Abrahamic promises of the descendant? The, the, the descendant of yours, one from your own body, I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. And what follows tells us that we're talking about Solomon, potentially. We're talking about one who commits iniquity who will be chastened. And the promise that his mercy or God's mercy will not depart away from Solomon. But we have to keep on going. We'll recognize that this is not the only passage that does this. First Chronicles chapter 17 does something very similar with some slight differences. And enough differences that we are going to see something going on that's bigger. You see much here that is very similar until you get to the end. He will build me a house. I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. I will not take my mercy away, but I will settle him in my house, my kingdom forever. His throne shall be established forevermore. If the Abrahamic covenant emphasized that the coming offspring, the descendant of Abraham, would bring blessing to the world, the Davidic covenant emphasizes that this blessing will be a king, a king that will rule and reign, a righteous king. Who will rule and reign critically forever. The final covenant that we have to talk about is the new covenant. And why is it a new covenant? It's new because God has made many promises, but Israel has sinned. And so the many promises combined with Israel's many sins leave us in a place where we're wondering, will the promises stand or not? I mean, maybe God has given up on Israel. Maybe Israel's sin has been so great that he's just going to turn them aside. And in fact, he sends them down to Babylon. They're back in bondage. It's almost like they went back to Egypt again. We're kind of right back where we were before. So is there still any hope for Israel? The answer of the new covenant is that not only will God reaffirm and repeat the promises he made before, but now he will make new, rich promises to the nation. The promises have not gone away. In fact, if anything, the promises have expanded. And Jeremiah 31 emphasizes this. The days coming that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. This covenant will be made with them in a way that will not be broken. I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. They shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, because I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And the last part of the promise actually compares the permanence of this promise to the sun. If the sun continues to light the, the, light the earth, if the moon and the stars continue to, to to circulate about or the earth spinning. If the sea itself, can, itself continues on, then God says, I will ensure that the seed of Israel will never cease from being a nation before me forever. There is no chance, there is no possibility of God turning back from his word. He has spoken. He will fulfill what he said he would do. Now, these three key passages together then give us a really good foundation for understanding the Old Testament. We talked about five eras going from Abraham, the creation, to second era, the Exodus and Joshua, the third era, Judges and the Kings, the exile, and finally returning to the land. But we could take those five chronological eras and we could graft in there or across that these three covenants that are also an important theological lens or a theological grid for understanding God's dealings with Israel. And those three together now are going to give us the, the conclusion that explains where we started. The three covenants that you need to know together with their passages are simply summarized here. 
And it's important for you to know each one of these covenants and to know also these passages, to know the basic content of each one of these covenants and to understand how they point forward ultimately to the Messiah. But do you remember that I started off a while ago in Matthew and I raised a question? The question was why I have this apparent emphasis on David, Abraham, and a bit later on, the carrying away to Babylon. And most troubling of all, or challenging of all, why this pattern, the summary of the entire genealogy at the end, all the generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations, from David until the carrying away into Babylon, 14 generations, the carrying away into Babylon into the Messiah, 14 generations. Why this outline giving us a structure of the genealogy that came just before, section one, two, and three, and the ending points for each one of them are kind of the hinges between them, Abraham, David, and Babylon. And if I'm putting those together with the framework that we use, the chronology we saw, each one of the periods of Israel's history, the rising hope, and then the crashing of Israel's sin and the destruction that comes, and then at the end, a little bit of a turn, a little bit of a hope that maybe things can be okay again. If you put that together with the Abrahamic, Davidic, and New Covenant promises that we discussed, I think now you begin to get a little bit of a clue. That clue is that God is intentionally highlighting three significant turning points in Israel's history. Abrahamic, Davidic, and New Covenants. Put that in terms of Matthew and the generations that he talks about from Abraham to David, David until the carrying away into Babylon, and Babylon until the coming of the Messiah. And Matthew's structuring of that to highlight these points, if we're following the line or the arc of the story, the beginning of the hope in Abraham the climax of the hope in David, the bottom or the crashing of the hope in the new covenant, and that turning upwards to say, oh, but the story's not over yet. Those points as the framework for the Old Testament, those points as the three major promises standing behind the Old Testament, and those points as pointing to the questions raised by the Old Testament and the longing of the Old Testament. When will the Messiah come? When will the hope promised to Abraham, the blessing for the entire world, when will he arrive? When will the righteous king arrive? The one who, like David, but so much greater, will reign in justice and bring hope at last to the nation. When will the one come connected to the new covenant who will finally take all of this chaos, this disorder, gather the nation back together, bring them together in one place, give them a new heart, transform them from the inside out so that instead they will know the Lord and obey and serve him? When will any of this happen? And the pointing, the pointer for all of this across the New Testament, the fulfillment of it all, is of course none other, other than the Messiah. The entire Old Testament points to him. I'll just conclude with this as an encouragement. Think of the faith that was necessary for people like Noah or Abraham or Ruth or David or Daniel. Here they are and they're living through these times. Noah is living through the flood. Abraham, though he receives promises of God's blessing, he doesn't see any of it. In fact, he's not even able to fathom how he could possibly have a child himself. Ruth, kind of cut off from the nation and blessing and connected to an Israelite who's despairing. David, seeing God's blessing and seeing the richness of the promises and then destroying it all by his sin. Daniel, living during the conquest and during in Babylon, seeing all of the, the results of Israel's sin and the judgment that has now come about. And the very natural response to all of that would be to despair. But the richness of the record we have in passages like Hebrews 11 is the reminder that these people, even when things seemed so dark, they looked in faith and they waited. They waited, they waited, they hoped, they longed for the coming of the Messiah. All of them died, Hebrews 11 reminds us. They never saw the fulfillment of the promise. They were still waiting at the end of their lives. And yet we know 
that eventually the Messiah did come. The promises were fulfilled. The hope of the nation and the hope of the world has dawned, and we have seen it. Now, how does that relate to us? Well, Jesus Christ came, lived, died, rose again 2,000 years ago. And he made a lot of promises to us as well. He promised that he's coming back. He promised that he would judge sin and he would bring about justice in the world. He promised that he would deliver and, and remove us from all of the chaos of this world before that judgment falls. And most significantly, he promised us the beautiful hope of the millennium and the new heavens and the new earth. He promised that he will make the world right and good. He promised all of that. It's been 2,000 years. And we're waiting. We're waiting, hoping, and longing. We're looking for the fulfillment. It's not immediately obvious when that will, fulfillment will come. But I think there's a lot of encouragement in recalling that we are not the first generation to wait and hope and long like this. Remember Noah. Remember Abraham. Remember David. Remember Daniel. Remember Ruth. Remember those who waited and hoped. And then remember that the Messiah came, and he will come again, in that you and I can take our confidence while we wait for the returning of our Savior and King.